Pastor Myring, Pastor, I'll let you uh, go ahead and uh, uh, get ready down there at the podium down below there. Gentlemen, I'll dismiss you. And uh, the guys are getting the live stream going there. And, uh, but Pastor Myring, I believe, sir, were you saved through this ministry here? Were you saved, uh, saved here and uh, had the, has been in and a part of Rose Park Baptist Church, church planning missionary for many years, him and his wife up in Canada. And uh, we've had a wonderful opportunity to get to know them. So, Pastor, I'm going to turn the service over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. It's good to be here tonight. Yesterday, I wasn't sure what was going to be happening tonight. I got my first, for arthritis now, I got my first injections in my knees. Have any of you ever had that? Look at that. Wow. More than I expected. It was kind of interesting. I didn't know how it was going to go. You know, it's, it's kind of tough getting older, isn't it? <laughs> I said older. Right. Amen, I didn't say old now, Brother Isaacs. Okay, just older. I came across a, a little poem that fits real well. I can live with my arthritis and my dentures fit me fine. I can see with my both bifocals, but I sure do miss my mind. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that hasn't come to any of us here yet. Hey, let's go to the book of Mark tonight. Mark, boy, you must have a tall person that's standing. That's all right. That's fine. I like it. Ah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I typically hold my Bible anyways. I don't have bifocals, but I had, uh, what do you call that, cataracts and lenses put in. And, well, actually, I had a retina detachment, too. I don't know what it is, but I, I'm, I almost because have to hold my... Really, this is a good position because I have to have my Bible about here. But the book of Mark tonight, uh, a key word for the book of Mark is servant. Amen. Jesus was a servant. Yes. And uh, in the book of Mark, it's the, it's the shortest of the Gospels. There are 16 chapters here in the book of Mark. And that kind of fits a servant. Not a whole lot is said. I think there's 70-some parables that Jesus gives throughout the, the Gospels, but only 18 are recorded in the book of Mark. On the other hand, on the other hand, there was uh, some, let's see, some 35 recorded miracles that Jesus performed, and more than half of them are recorded in the book of Mark. So Mark shows Jesus as a servant as a man of action, doing, and sometimes it behooves us, I think, to be talk maybe less and do more. And we're going to go to chapter 2, and we're going to see some of that action right here in the story. By the way, the book of Mark, there's no genealogy. That fits a servant, doesn't it? A servant doesn't have a genealogy. He's a nobody. That's all of us. If we've been saved by grace, we're just nobodies. Saved by grace on our way to heaven one of these days. But in chapter 2, I'm not going to read the verses 1 to 12. We'll go through them, but I'm sure you're familiar with them from your Sunday school days. The story of the sick man that was brought to Jesus and then let down through the roof and Jesus healed him. So you know the story, but I want to look at this tonight in, in uh, sort of the sense of bringing people to Jesus. That's what they were doing, wasn't it? They were bringing this man to Jesus. That's what we should be doing. Amen. Church, that's what you're here for. Amen. That's why we live, to bring people to Jesus. And uh, so we'll see that tonight. I want to show you some difficulties or problems or obstacles, if you want to put it that way. We'll look at some obstacles in this passage. We'll look at some helps that I believe are evident here, and then a couple results at the end this evening, okay? So let's begin here in verse, uh, well, let's go down to verse 3. It sets the scene for us, and I'll tell you what, let's pray before we go any further, okay? Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for all of the folks that are here, teenagers, as I understand, are in here tonight. God bless them. They've got young lives with so much before them. Should you tarry your coming, Lord, may they be found faithful. And uh, we just ask that you bless the pastor of this church. Thank you for him. 
and Brother Tim and his wife as well, Sister Tawny. Bless all the folks here. And uh, Lord, we just pray tonight that you would clear our minds from the fog that can develop in this world today and uh, the cares that we carry. Uh, tonight, just help us to be able to see you and to hear from you this evening from your word, for it's in your name I pray, amen. Okay, we were on verse 3, and we're looking at some obstacles to bringing people to Jesus. Verse 3, and, there, and they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, what was the press? That, I know, that's ABC, NBC, Fox News. That's the press, right? No, it's the people. The people, okay? They could not get to Jesus because of the people. Do you know what? Sometimes people can be a hindrance for us bringing others to Christ. I think it was Charlie Brown that said, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand. You know, <laughs> there'll always be problems with people because we're human. And if we're not careful, sometimes those problems can interfere with us bringing others to Christ. And so we have to be careful about that. People bringing others to Christ. Now let's go on. Verse 4, they uncovered the roof to get him to Jesus. They couldn't get near to him because of the people, so they uncovered the roof. Now as I understand it, in Bible days, they, most of the buildings, homes, and so forth were flat roofs, okay, and stairways going up, I think is the typical picture or mental image we have of homes in that day. Now, how did they get him through the roof, okay? Here's an obstacle, all right? Here's, uh, here's a, a something that's preventing them from getting Jesus. I don't know how they did it. Did they have tools? Did they carry tools on their belts? And they were able to take out the stones uh, that, or whatever it was comprising the, the roof of that house so they could make a hole big enough and the roof wouldn't cave in and so forth? I don't know. But obstacles. There will be obstacles in us bringing people to Jesus. Amen. When we were in Manitoba, uh, we thought we got there and... Uh, it was a case where the missionary that was before us took care of all of the church cleaning. And uh, he, he just did, and that's fine. If, if that's the way the Lord wanted him to. I thought it would be nice if the people got involved and helped. Okay, it's a good, simple thing. I mean, you, you might not be able to do that here, bigger church and so forth. This was small. We could do that. But uh, we, we put up a sign-up sheet. Yeah, pretty simple, huh? Simple stuff. And sign up if you'll clean the church from week to week. And so people sign up. We had one, one family in the church that didn't like that. They didn't think that was the way it should be. The missionary, he should be the church cleaner. And so when it, they did sign up, and when it was their turn, what they did is they hid things around the church to see if the people next week would get those things. Can you imagine it? Can you believe people would do something like that? Obstacles, difficulties, problems in bringing people to Jesus. Now let's go on and see what else we can find here. Okay, they brought him, there was the press, they had to uncover the roof, and by the way, you go through this passage, maybe you can find some others that I, <clears throat> I'm missing here. And when they had broken it up, how did they do that? I don't know. They let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, okay, we'll come back to that, okay? He said unto the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, you have to read between the lines a little bit, but I think you can see perhaps another obstacle or difficulty involved in bringing people to Jesus. Now, now think about it. They broke up the roof, Jesus saw their faith, and he said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. 
what did they bring the sick man to Jesus for? To be healed, right? But what did Jesus do? He forgave his sins. Now, here's the thing. Jesus had the order right. The greatest need in that man's life was to have his sins forgiven and then be healed. But if you read between the lines a little bit here, what took place? Some time took place, didn't it? It had to have. Here, Jesus forgave sins. Now, it might not have been a lot of time, but some did. Instead of immediately healing that man, Jesus dealt with the greater issue, his soul and his eternity. And here's, here's the thought. In bringing people to Jesus, sometimes it takes time. It, it might be a little bit of time. It might, maybe, in fact, it'll be quick. But a lot of times, there's going to have to be patience. You're going to have to be faithful. And you're going to have to work at bringing somebody to Jesus. It could be a lost family member that you have. And uh, you've been praying for them for who knows how long. Years and years and years. Don't get tired of it. Amen. Don't stop. Keep on praying and keep on working to bring that person to Jesus, to a place where they know Christ as their Savior. So, some time took place. But anyways, go on in verse 6, and really here, here's more time that passes. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And so more time has taken place. Jesus now has to deal with these scribes that are sitting there instead of getting to the business at hand. But then in verse 8, it says, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned with himself, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? And so it took time for them to bring them to Jesus. Obstacles, obstacles that we face. Now, I don't want to get stuck on the obstacles, all right? There's probably others that you can find here, but let me get to the helps, okay? Because this is where it gets good, all right? There's all kinds of problems. There's all kinds of obstacles. But let's look back up to verse 2 to see some of the helps. It says, and straightway. Straightway is a word that goes good with a servant. You tell a servant to do something, straightway they do it. Or the word immediately down in verse 8. That's a servant. All right? So in verse 2, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Now right away, you ought to see a couple helps that jump off the page, don't you? The word. He preached the word to them. Okay? Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. We have something that's powerful here, folks. Amen. What a help we have. Yeah. I remember when I was in Bible college, we had Lester Roloff come and speak for us. Actually, several times he did, and he's long gone. That name might not mean anything to most of you, but he was an old-time preacher, evangelist, and, uh, and he actually, he flew in with his airplane. He was a pilot, and he flew in to the meeting uh, where I was at Bible College, <coughs> and uh, he told this story afterwards. There were some young men that were there to greet him, usher him back to the campus and so forth. And he handed out a, a Bible to the fellow that was at the bottom of the steps there on the airplane. And the fellow reached out to take it and Brother Roloff said, watch out! Scared him. Watch out! He didn't know what to make of it. He says, that's a sword, young man. Be careful. That's a sword. It's powerful, the Word of God. Not only that, but we already read it. He preached the word unto them. Wow, you've got something, a sword here, something powerful, and he preached the word. 1 Corinthians 1 8, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the 
power of God. Whatever obstacle you might have, church, individuals, bringing people to Jesus, you've got something that is powerful. The Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God. And, and that's what I love about this church and, and through its, its years, Brother Ken, uh, the fact that this has been a Bible preaching church and your pastor is a Bible preacher here today and, and be thankful for that and to be thankful for the preaching of the Word of God. It's powerful. Wow. And the preaching of the Word is what will bring people to Jesus Christ. Well, let's go on. Verse 3, because I think you can see a couple more helps here. And they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy. So you say, Brother Kim, what's the help here? What's the help? They brought one that was sick of the palsy. The help is that there was a need. A need. Now, now let me, let me uh, give you a hypothetical situation here. We're by Butternut Drive, busy road here. What if we're all sitting here tonight and all of a sudden we hear the screech of tires, crash! Now, right away, everybody knows what happened. It's out here. Everybody knows what happened, right? There was a crash out there. Now, what are we going to do? Well, some of you men that are in the back, out the foyer, uh, ushers, whoever, somebody's going to go out there and see. And it's bad. There's a lot of people that are hurt. There's a need. You, 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 we're not going to come. Oh, we've got to keep church. We, gotta, we can't. Nobody go out there. No, come back in here. You can't go help. Of course we'd help. We'd do whatever we had to do. And of course, we, we know that EMS and emergency personnel will get here quickly. But we'd do whatever we had to do, right? Why? Because there's a need. Can we see the need today? In Holland, wherever you live, do you see the need? It says in Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the, speaking of Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Amen. He saw them. Do you see your next door neighbor? Do you see your extended family? Uh, do, do you see the city of Holland, your, your neighborhood? Do we see? Do we see people lost and dying and going to hell? Do we have that vision? You know what? It'll make a difference if we see the need. Open our eyes. Open our eyes. Well, another one in verse 3, okay? One sick of the palsy, which was born of four. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, they weren't alone. It wasn't just one person bringing the sick man to Jesus. Amen. Okay, it, it, If he was, I don't know, he would have had to carry him in his arms. It sounds like they had some sort of a stretcher of some sort there in four corners. Okay, But if, they, if it was just one person, how would he have done that? Just drag him maybe along or pick him up and carry him? And, I suppose it could be done, but there were four. They weren't alone. Wow, pastor, here's an army. Amen. Church, you're an army. You're not alone. You're working at this together. Thank God for that. You remember uh, Elijah, was it back in 1 Kings or something? Remember after his, his uh, great victory on uh, uh, Mount Carmel? And I uh, hope I'm getting this all right. And, uh, and he came down from, uh, you know, where God brought fire from heaven and burnt up the altar and all those false prophets. Remember that great victory he had? And then, then he came down from the mount and uh, he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot? Man. But then he got the word. Jezebel wanted his head. Uh-oh. And he got in the dumps. He got defeated. He, he even said, if you go back there, let me die. I want to die. 
And God came to him and said, because he said, I'm all alone. God said, no, you're not all alone. What was it, 3,000 or 7,000, Pastor? I forgot the number. I didn't check that tonight. Uh, God said, there's 3,000 others who have not bowed a knee to Baal. Sometime when you think you're all alone and you're going at it all alone, realize you're not. I mean, even if we were, of course, we should continue on. But the good news is that we're, we're not. Uh, hopefully, in many cases, you have a Christian mate. You're not alone in that respect or, or a loved one. Uh, someone that knows the Lord and they're there. You can encourage one another and that's what we should be doing. Encouraging one another and bringing people to Jesus. And uh, remember, you're not alone. And of course, we're never alone uh, with, uh, with the Lord. So then let's see. Um, let's go down to verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, and of course I can't skip over that, uh, there had been some, un, some lack of faith before with these scribes, okay, but Jesus points out that there's the need for faith, and that must be true on our part as well. There has to be faith, believing believing that the Lord is going to work. Well, let me give you another one. And again, as I said, you could go through this passage and find others yourself. But let's see, let's go down to verse, we read verse eight, but let me pick up there again. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Then he says in verse nine, whether is it harder to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? Amen? Yes. What? Yes. Amen? Yes. Did, did I read that right? Huh? Whether, why reason ye these things in your Whether is it Oh, I got it wrong, didn't I? Did you catch that? I said, whether is it harder to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? Oh, I made a mistake. It doesn't say harder, it says easier. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy? You know what? With God, nothing's hard. It's all easy. Amen. This is easy. This is easy. God can do it. Believe. Have faith. Whether is it easier to say. Now, let me give you a couple results here tonight, okay? A couple results of bringing people to Jesus. And we'll go down to the last, uh, pretty much the last verse here. Well, no, let's go ahead... Um, and read verse 11. I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. He was healed. And immediately, there's that word immediately again, straightway, immediately, he arose, took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed. Here's a result of bringing people to Jesus. People's lives are changed. If you've come to Jesus tonight, your life has been changed. Yes. Yeah. If you haven't come to Jesus tonight, you need to let him change your life. Amen. Because that's the business he's in, life-changing business. Life-changing business. When we were up here at Harbor Light Baptist Church, we had a gentleman start coming probably within our first year up there. His name, well, I'm not going to give you his name. He's, he was, uh, uh, his wife had passed away. He was in the category of getting older, okay? Not old, getting older. <clears throat> Nicest fella in the world. Uh, he, he lives on the south side of Grand Haven, and uh, he came, uh, and he started attending. Oh, and he was so pleasant, so pleasant. Uh, his father had, uh, I forget now if he said his father was a Methodist pastor, I'm not sure. Uh, and I won't hold that against him if that was the case, but uh, um, at the end of services, 
Uh, I often had a habit of asking people to raise their hands if they know, knew for certain uh, that they were saved, that they were on their way to heaven, uh, that they were a child of God or something like that. And, uh, and generally, and then most in the, but uh, this individual, well, his first name was Larry. And Larry uh, never raised his hand. So I was concerned about him, uh, really concerned. And I tried to make his friendship. And um, I, I started going over to his house and talking to him. Well, then he actually, it was about the time of the year winter when he was going to go to Florida for a couple of weeks to see his son living down there. And I, and I thought, oh, Lord. Uh, and uh, I just, I don't want him to die when he's down there. And he didn't. He got back and went over to his house again. Uh, I, I was just asking God for the right time. And uh, we sat at his kitchen table, and we were just talking about things. And he said, you know, Pastor... He finally got to this. He said, you know, Pastor, he said, you talk about raising, your, at the end of your service, you have people raise their hand if they know for sure that they're going to heaven. And he says, I, I don't know that for sure. Wow, <laughs> what an open opportunity, Pastor. Uh, op the door is open, walk in, you know. And I said, well, I said, Larry, I said, you can know that. Uh, you, you got a little bit of time? How about if we take the Bible and look at Yeah, yeah that'd be good. And, uh, and we went through the plan of salvation. And all. Of, he didn't have a problem with any of that. He understood. He was a sinner. He understood Jesus on the cross died to save. But he really had no new birth experience being born again. He couldn't say that. And I said, Larry, would you like to settle this matter and, and know for certain that you're saved, that you're on your way to heaven? And he said, yeah, I'd like that. Boy, I mean, I tell you, Pastor, wasn't any, any riper. Uh, and, and so right there at his kitchen table, I said, Larry, let's pray. And he prayed. And he confessed his sin, his need of salvation. And he, he asked the Lord to forgive him, to come into heart, his heart and to save him. Wow. And you know what? The next Sunday in church when I said the invitation, if you know for sure you're going your way to heaven, slip your hand up. You know whose hand was up right up there? Larry's. His life was changed. Now he was a good man before, but he needed to be saved. His heart was black with sin and needed to be made, made white as snow by the crimson blood of Jesus Christ. And he got saved. I had coffee with him at Russ's in Grand, Grand Haven a couple weeks ago. Had a good time. He's still faithful in church, still coming. Uh, through COVID, he was absent a little bit, but uh, he's back and he's still there. Lives get changed. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Your life. How did your life change when you got saved? I was saved, like Pastor said, here as a young person. So, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of obvious change in my life as a young child okay uh, nevertheless my life changed and I went in a different direction that I would have gone if I hadn't been changed and some of you were changed your life was changed you came to know the Lord later in life and you can really uh, know the experience of your life being changed hallelujah tonight that God is still in the life-changing business and you know someone that is, is uh, that maybe it's a family member that needs to get saved. And uh, it's been so hard. There's been obstacles. And you say, oh, it's, I don't know, it's so hard. What is it with Jesus? Easier, easier. Be faithful in prayer. Now let me give you one last result. <clears throat> Finish verse 12 with me, okay? insomuch that they were all amazed. We ought to be amazed. And glorified God, saying we never saw it on this fashion. They glorified God. God gets the glory. Amen? Amen. I heard a story a long time ago, and it's a story, about uh, a young boy and his dad at this time of year. Okay, springtime. Uh, at least I thought it was spring until the, today came around. 
springtime, and uh, man, you've been shut up all winter, and the kids have, and they want to get up, and this is a young, young lad, and uh, he, uh, uh, he's about at that age where he's ready to get a bicycle. Boy, his dad wants to get him a bicycle real bad, and uh, so one day they decide, okay, son, we're going to go down to the bike store today. Oh, boy, that's great. That's great. And, and now the father wanted to teach his son uh, a little bit about the value of money and so forth. And so he said, now, son, you, you've been saving some money in your piggy bank, and you go ahead and get what you have in there. And, uh, and so he did, and he came back, and the dad, they go, down, they go down in their car to the bike store, and they look all around, and dad says, now you find the one you like, son. And so he hunts, and man, you can just, if you have kids, you, you know the experience, you know, get, it's, it's, it's fun, it's a joy. And the boy finally finds the one he likes. I like this one, Dad. Oh, man, it's got chrome, and it's got high handlebars, and okay, all right, let's go out. We'll go home now with it. We got to go up to the counter. We got to pay for this. And so they get up to the counter, and and uh, the father says, okay, now, son, put your money up on the counter. And the boy goes in his pocket, and he pulls out a quarter. And he puts the quarter on the counter. And uh, the father says, okay, son, why don't you wheel the bike out and go out by the car, and I'll be out in a minute. Now, the bike cost $100. So the dad proceeds to take out his checkbook and write a check for the balance owed, which would be what, $99.75, I guess it would be? Writes out a check and gives it to the lady, paid in full, and they go home. And boy, the boy is so excited. He's got himself a new bike, and he's riding the bike up and down the street and so forth. Pretty soon, his little neighborhood friend comes out, and uh, he sees him on his new, he says, whoa! That's a nice bike you got. Yeah, it's brand new. We just went down to the bike store and we got it today. It's brand new. And, and the, his little friend says, oh, I wish I, could, I wish I could have a bike like that. And, and the first little boy who got the bike, he said, well, you can. You can. It, it only costs a quarter. <laughs> you got a quarter? Yeah, yeah, I got a quarter in my drawer. Go get your quarter. We'll go to the bike store. So the second little boy proceeds to go get his quarter. And somehow they go down to the bike store, probably with not with permission. But anyway, they go to the bike store. And they go inside and, and uh, they say, now what one do you like? The first boy says to the other boy, you find the one you like. And so they hunt around and, and they look and, and, uh, and they... Uh, Finally, the second little boy finds the one he likes. Oh, it's a nice bike. And they roll it up to the counter. And uh, <clears throat> the sales, it happened to be the same sales lady, okay? And she says, uh, oh, that's a nice bike. And, and the boy reaches in his pocket and he puts his quarter on the counter. And the lady, she was a smart lady and she was thinking, she says, oh, oh, oh son, she says, that's not enough. It costs more than 25 cents to buy. And the first little boy, he gets a little defensive and he says, well, how come? He says, I got my bike for a quarter here yesterday. How come? And the lady was very kind. And she said, oh, son, she said, there was a difference. Your father was with you. Now, do you get the analogy? Do you understand the point of that little story? If you do, nod your head. Your father was with you. We got our little quarters are pretty meaningless, aren't they, really? It's more like pennies. Pennies we offer. That, that, it's all him. He gets the glory. Your father was with you. Amen. Pastor.
We give him every head bowed and every eye closed. Time of visitation. The musicians come. We'll stand this evening with our heads bowed.